right at the beginning of this seminar, we're going to uh, do a little quiz just to see uh, what we uh, know about Islam. Just 10 brief questions, true and false. So um, let's, let's look at these questions. The first one, the Quran states that Jesus is the Messiah. How many put true? How many did false? I've already said that Jesus is the Messiah, so I hope you all got that right. <laughs> so there is an area now of convergence between the Christian faith and Islam. Both Muslims and Christians believe that Jesus is the Messiah. However, like we said earlier on, we find that as Christians meet Muslims, within every area of convergence, there is divergence. So you could say, here we're coming together, and yet you find that because the centers are different, Quran and the Messiah, this Messiah being the center for the Christian faith and the Quran for the Muslim faith, we find within those convergences there are divergences. So here is an example. We believe, both believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So alhamdulillah, we're together. Amen. We believe Jesus is the Messiah. That's just wonderful. And then you ask your Muslim friend, what does it mean for Jesus to be the Messiah? He will probably say, it means that Jesus had a limited mission for a limited period of time only to the house of Israel. What? Is that what Messiah means? Not according to the Bible and not according to the New Testament witness, you see. Messiah has a much greater, fuller mission than to have a limited mission for a limited period of time only to the house of Israel. And so within the convergence, you find divergence. Now let's look at the next one. The Quran states that Christians are the closest to Muslims in faith. True? False? True. I'm very delighted to see so many hands going up. That is true. However, again, the Quran says, give your Muslim friend a test. Read the Quran to them. And if they fall on the ground and confess, this is truly the word of God, then you know their heart is sincere. If you read the Quran to them and they don't believe the Quran is the word of God, then you know that their heart is not sincere, you see. And in fact, then there's even warnings in the Quran against becoming friends of the Christians, for they might deceive you because their heart is not sincere and they have a different center. They've not accepted that the Quran is the word of God, you see. And so again, we're very happy for that comment in the Quran. Christians are the closest to Muslims in faith, become their friends, go to their feasts, and you go and you go to their feasts, you see. All of that is very, very good. We try to build upon that. But there's also there's warnings in the Quran. Be careful, lest they deceive you and take you away from the Muslim faith. Third, Muslims believe in a second coming of Jesus the Messiah. True? False? It's true. They believe that Jesus is coming back again at the end of history. And so we say, Alhamdulillah, praise the Lord. Muslims and Christians are agreed. Jesus is coming back again at the end of history. Isn't that wonderful? We're all together. And then you say, and what will Jesus do when he comes back again? And our Muslim friends say, oh, when he comes back again, he will destroy all the crosses because the cross is a lie. He was never crucified. He was taken to heaven bodily. And he will scold the Christians because they have not become Muslims and because they've said that he is the son of God. And Jesus will convert the Christians to Islam. And some traditions also, this is not in the Quran, but some traditions also say he will kill all the pigs. So all of you Russians who are pig lovers, beware when he comes back again, no more pigs to eat because pigs are a defiled animal that you should not eat. And so he comes back really as an Islamic leader according to Islamic traditions and according to the Quran when he returns again. Some traditions suggest that he will come back as judge at the end of history. Um, and uh, so we raise with our Muslim friends the question, if he comes back as judge, 
then how should we relate to him now? Um, it's a very, very important question. So again, convergence, but within that convergence, we find divergence. Um, <clears throat> number four, the Quran commands Christians to stand by all that God has revealed to them. True? False? It's true. That's true. Oh, you people of the book, stand upon your scriptures. Stand upon the Torah and all the scriptures that God has revealed to you. And uh, we're referred to in the Quran as the people of the book with great respect. And in my work with Muslims, I share with them many times I am a person of the book. I stand upon these scriptures. I read them daily. They have formed me for a lifetime. <laughs> this is my foundation upon which I stand, these scriptures, and they bear witness to the centrality of the Messiah. And that opens doors. I uh, have a friend of mine, an acquaintance, who is working in Pakistan with the Taliban. And um, he goes into these Taliban areas and his credentials are, I'm a person of the book. Ooh, we must respect you. I would like to talk with you. Oh, okay. And so they sit together with the Taliban leaders. And he says, now as I read the Quran as a Christian, as a follower of the Messiah, as a person of the book, I notice that the Quran says that God has determined that there will be many religions so that Muslims learn to live peacefully in a pluralistic world. Are you teaching that in your madrasas? Well, they hadn't quite thought of that. And so he works with them at examining the madrasa curriculum. <laughs> and in some cases, they're rewriting the curriculum. I just got a letter from him yesterday again about this. Rewriting the curriculum to build into the curriculum in these madrasas, these Muslim madrasas, that we should live peacefully in a pluralistic world, you see. What's his credentials that enables him to do that? Ah, here's a person of the book. You see, that opens doors. That opens doors, being a person of the book. Number five, there are a number of references to the Holy Spirit in the Quran. True? False? Some people aren't voting either way. True? False? <laughs> Some don't want to declare themselves. <laughs> which means you don't know. <laughs> so you don't want to guess. It's true. It's true. There's a number of references, in fact, quite a number of references to the Holy Spirit in the Quran. However, again, talking about divergence and convergence, when we ask our Muslim friends, what does it mean, these references to the Holy Spirit, what do they usually say? Do you know what they usually say? They usually say it's Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, you see. Now, I have a quote on here translated by Yusuf Ali, who is um, a Lebanese scholar. And uh, he says that to say, by Ab Abdullah Yusuf Ali, he says that to say that all these references to the Holy Spirit in the Quran are Gabriel just isn't true. If you really look deeply, um, the Holy Spirit, he says, is in the Quran, is what this Muslim scholar says. And that's, that's how it looks to me as I read the Quran, that, um, that uh, it's not always Gabriel, no. But what we do is to invite our Muslim friends, come and look at what the Injil, what the Gospel says about the Holy Spirit, and you will understand more fully the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's not Gabriel. The Holy Spirit is not Gabriel. The Holy Spirit is, uh, is God's presence with us, convicting of sin and empowering us to live righteously, bringing about conversion and new life, the gift of the Holy Spirit, um, not always Gabriel. Number six, question six. The Quran commands Christians to make the scriptures available for others to read. True? False? That's true. That's true. I'm very pleased with the excellent work you're doing in this uh, quiz. Um, apparently, you've already done some study of Islam. That's true. The Quran commands us Christians, don't hide your scriptures. Make them freely available. Remember that, freely available. If you need to charge money for the Bible when you give it to a Muslim friend, 
don't charge for a profit. Only charge what you paid for it, you see. It doesn't say you can't ask any money, but it says never ever give out scripture making a profit on scripture because scripture is for everyone to read, you see. So make your scriptures freely accessible is what the Quran commands. That's a nice verse, isn't it? <laughs> now, we all know that oftentimes when you seek to give a Bible to a Muslim friend, you say, oh, it's corrupted, it's corrupted, it's corrupted. And some um, have such a warped view of the Bible that they won't even look at it. For the even to look at it is dangerous. But that's not in the Quran at all. The Quran has a very high respect for the Bible. And it, the Quran does not believe the Bible is corrupted. We'll talk more about that later on. And it commands us, make them freely available. Now in Somalia, where it was illegal to propagate Christianity, when students would ask for the Bible, what we would do would be to give it to them, but they would always sign a paper saying, I voluntarily asked for this. Nobody forced me or urged me to take it. They would sign that paper. We would put it in the files in case the police ever wanted to investigate. We would say, look, we're not giving out Bibles by force. No, if people come and ask us, we let them have a Bible and they ask for it voluntarily. And that seemed quite satisfactory. So one must distribute scriptures with appropriate discretion, but the Quran does command us, make the scriptures freely available to all who wish to read them. A very wonderful command. Number seven, Muslims believe that Jesus was born to a virgin. It's true. It's true. The Quran says he was born to the virgin Miriam, the sister of Aaron. Our Muslim friends say, well, all Israelites are are related, you know, all are brothers and sisters. So Jesus was born, of course, to a sister of Aaron, uh, just as you might say he was born to a sister of Moses or a sister of Joshua, whatever you know. It's part of the Israeli um, um, family connections that everybody's brother and sister to each other. But he's born to the virgin. That's never developed in the Quran as to what that means. We'll talk more about that later in this seminar. Uh, ways in which we can bear witness to what it means for Jesus to be born of the Virgin. But that's very, very significant. Jews don't believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin, but Muslims do. Number eight, the Quran states that Jesus is the Word of God. True? False? It's true. It's true. He is referred to in the Quran as Kalimatullah. meaning the Word of God. Kalim At of God, the Word of God. We'll talk more about that later on. This is a very, very interesting reference to Jesus in the Quran. Of course, when you ask Muslims, what does it mean for Jesus to be the Word of God? They will say, well, what it means is that God spoke and he was miraculously created in the womb of the Virgin, just as God spoke and Adam was miraculously created, you see. So the Quran opens the door here to attempt to uh, invite a consideration of the incarnation, the word becoming human and living among us. But the Quranic understanding tends to take us in another direction saying, no, what it really means is God spoke and he was created. So here again, convergence, but within the convergence, you also find some divergence. But we'll talk more about that later on in the seminar. This is a very, very interesting statement in the Quran that he is the Word of God. The Quran also says that he is the Spirit of God, Isaruhula, Jesus the Spirit of God, also in the Quran. Number nine, the Quran advises Muhammad to ask Christians what their scriptures say. True? False? It's true. It's true. I like that verse in the Quran very, very much. Quran says to Muhammad, if you have doubt about anything, if you have any doubts about anything, ask those that have the former scriptures and they will be helpful to you. I remind Muslims of that verse many, many times. I say, I'm a person of the book. And the Quran says that you who are Muslims, if you have any questions to ask the people of the book, why ask us? And we'll be very happy to share with you what these scriptures say. Any questions to ask me? And then sometimes they will say, yes, 
But the cordon also warns us, be careful, lest the Christians take you astray. And so I always find that ambivalence on the part of my Muslim friends. Yes, David is our very best friend. <laughs> He's a person of the book. We need to ask you what the scriptures say, but be careful. Be careful, he might lead you astray. He might lead you astray. Always that ambivalence, you know. Um, I was in West Africa uh, about three years ago, and um, meeting with a very, a very well-known Muslim leader in central Burkina Faso. And he was there with his disciples sitting all around him, and he was holding forth on Islam and giving us a long lecture about Islam and on and on he was going. And the time came then for us to leave. And I said, before I leave, uh, I'm a person of the book, as is the pastor who is with me here, the local pastor. We are people of the book. And um, you've been explaining Islam to us with great detail and, um, and uh, thank you very much. But as we go, just do you have any questions to ask us? Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com. As Christians who are people of the book, the, pe the previous scriptures, I remember that Muhammad was commanded to ask the Christians what the scriptures say. Um, do you have any questions that you might want to ask? Oh, yes, 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 he says, we should ask questions if we have any questions, but do we have any questions? And he's going on like that, you know, do we have any questions to ask? And uh, on and on. And I said, now seriously, do you have any questions? Yes, he said, I do have a question. Did Jesus prophesy? that after him, there will be a new scripture revealed. Now I said, Jesus did not prophesy that. In fact, Jesus, the last verses of the Bible warn us very strongly against writing any additional scripture. Book of Revelation, the last verses, very strong warning, don't do it. So, um, no, the biblical scriptures are closed. We're warned against any other scripture. Hmm. He said that is a very big problem. So that was his question. A very good question. Very good question. So we invite our Muslim friends, ask us any questions you might have. That's important. And oftentimes they will have a question to ask. Number 10, the last question. The Quran states that Jesus fulfills the scriptures. True? False? It's true. It's true. Jesus fulfills the Torah and the scriptures according to the Quran, you see. And so in our work with Muslims, we often say, well, what does the Torah say? What does the Old Testament say about Jesus? He fulfills these scriptures. Let's look at what they say. That's our invitation. Yeah. Okay. How many of you got 100% on those 10 questions? Wonderful. Wonderful, Sasha. That's great. That's great. That's great. Yeah. How many got uh, only, uh, got 90%? How many got 80%? How many? Very, very good. I'm very pleased with you. How many got them all wrong? Don't put up your hand. <laughs> but these are examples now of convergences and divergences that we will be exploring more deeply in the next several days of this seminar. Any questions that you have? You said that Muslim comes to you asking for Bible and you ask him to sign a, some kind of paper that he asked for it freely. Would this uh, create any problem for this person? Well, th this, this was only in the Somali context mm -hmm. where it was illegal to propagate Christianity against the law, you see. And so uh, in that case, uh, he and we would agree together that uh, if the police ever investigate, they need to know that he has voluntarily asked for this. It might create problems for him, um, uh, but it was, it was the way in which we functioned and everybody understood this as being acceptable. Otherwise, we could be accused of trying to force students to read the Bible, you see. Yeah, but it's true. It maybe could create problems for him. But on the other hand, um, 
we had such a good relationship with Muslim leaders in Somalia and with political leaders that um, they would support this approach, you know. I remember one time in Somalia, I, I was the director of the mission for a while, and I uh, was speaking with some of the authorities, government officials. I said, I think I should tell you openly how we function in relationship to this prohibition of, um, of uh, propagating Christianity. No, they said, don't tell us. We know what you're doing. If you make a mistake, we'll let you know. But just don't make mistakes. <laughs> you see, they wanted us to have space to function. Um, don't be unwise. Be wise, was their advice. And this approach was a wise way to work, I think. They all recognize that. Yes. I wonder if Quran prohibits for a Muslim to read or to have the Bible at no. home. No, 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 no. Okay, no, if no. it's not prohibited, does it... No, not at all, no. Does it no. advise him to have it? No, it doesn't advise him to have it, but it does advise him to ask the Christians for any questions they might have. But is any country, like, prohibit for Muslims to have the Bible at their homes? Well... The, the, uh, the government laws or something. I can't answer that question, that there's that, if, that, that there's that prohibition. I think some of the imams will say you must not have a Bible. They will command the people not to get Bibles. They'll say it's corrupted and it's magical, things like that. But all of those are distortions of what the Quran says about the Bible. The Quran has a very high respect for the Bible. Their meaning are corrupted, you'll tell us later. I'll talk more about that. We have a whole session on that. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.